So when you mount a workpiece on a lino, a lot of books say you should draw an X from corner to corner, and then that's the center. That's really not very accurate, you know, because, okay, now I don't even have a point to go to, so how do I make that accurate? Um, what you really want to do is um, arrive at a center point by measuring from the flat sides, not from the corners. So with a marking gauge, you go around and you do this four times. And then what you get is a very tiny little tic-tac-toe. This doesn't have to be set to the center. It's, you, don't, you don't have to adjust this to half. You just adjust it so it's kind of half. And you do this four times, and you'll get that little tiny tic-tac-toe, which is right now, um, we, we use it all and make a little center point there, uh, center indentation. Okay. And um, so here's the things that you should never do. You should never take a saw and saw an X on the end of the work. You should never take a spur center and drive it into the end to make it indentation. And the one thing you should never, never, never do is hold this up to the lathe and hit this with a mallet because that will damage the bearings of the lathe. So you don't do any of those three things um, because you don't have to. Those are just a waste of time, those things. So, okay. So I'm using a spur center uh, that has a spring in the center point, and it also has uh, this guard that adjusts itself. Uh, the guard keeps you from getting um, your sleeve caught in there or your hair or jewelry um, or running into it with a chisel or running into it with a tool rest. All those are things you don't want to this, Yeah, this, I have a patent on this and Rikon sells them for me. Um, well, see what I, I have it now on, on the center points, but the spurs are not touching the work. So I can still turn it. And um, this is good. So when I when I start the lathe, you see, the workpiece isn't going to rotate until the spurs are engaged. So as I bring this up, first it hits the guard, the guard retracts, and now the spurs are engaged. So now I'm I'm ready to turn. And when I take that out, and see I can stop it. So I don't have to turn off the motor every time I want to stop it. <coughs> So in order to turn a long, thin piece like this, we need a steady rest. And this is the type of steady rest that I use, and I'm going to show you how to use this. And whether you, no matter what kind of steady rest you use, you have to have a place for the steady rest to go, and that place has to be round. And right now, there's no round place for it to go. So the first thing you want to do is create a round place for the steady rest. Um, I'm going to start out with a roughing gouge, although a roughing gouge being rather large might not work. I'm just going to see how well it works. That works pretty well, but it's too big. And you know what I really need is a smaller chisel that will take a narrower chip that will impart a smaller force and therefore impart less vibration. So I'm using my hand as a steady rest at this stage. And my hand's doing two things. I mean, one is that it's steadying the vibration. And two is that it's going to tell me when the flats are gone. And I actually have a round surface. Well, it's not essential that this be perfectly straight, but what is essential is two things. One is that it's perfectly round, meaning that all the flats are gone. And two is that there are no chatter marks. 
So you can't have any chatter marks initially where you create this place. So technically this is called a journal. And a journal is, not, is simply a place on a shaft where the, bear, where the bearing is gonna go. So, okay, you know, if, if I get vibrations from this chisel, I would simply go to a smaller chisel. And with a smaller chisel, I get a really narrow chip and perfectly round. Now, uh, if he's a 220, I'm going to sand this for one and a half seconds and no more. Ready? That's it. Don't sand it any more than that because whenever you sand something, it becomes lumpy. Because wood is not even, this is not metal or plastic, it's, it's wood. And it has hard and soft areas. So if you sand it, it becomes lumpy. And then the steady rest will run smoothly. And now we bring up the steady rest. So what is this thing? Where's, all right. so, so this is what it is. It's a piece of one inch steel that's been turned down to a half inch with a thread. And uh, this type of nut, I'm sure you've seen these, these are, have a nylon ring, it's called nylon. So a nut like this will lock, you know, wherever you put it. If you tighten a certain place, it stays there. You, yeah, you can also, if you don't wanna spring 75 cents for one of these nuts, you can just take two nuts and lock them together. That's a little more. So this, this is what it is. And, and these are the shoes that are made out of white pine or basswood or something really soft. And you may, you know, when I was selling these and I, if there's interest in this, I'll make more of these. Um, I was selling these with a large and a small shoe, but you can make these yourself to fit whatever kind of work you're doing. You just drill a half inch hole and see, you know, here's, here's a very small one that I use on my pool cue shafts, which you're gonna see here. At the and, and this is a one inch shaft. So it goes in a tool rest base. So yes, you need two tool rest bases if you want to use this system. And I'm going to show you what's so convenient about this. Here. So this, this nut is tightened to where this still has freedom to swivel. So when you bring it up, you know, it's, it's self-aligning. Loosen this just, you know, when the weather changes, you have to make little adjustments. The grain on the shoe is horizontal. Okay, so when I bring this up, it, it's self-aligning. But what I need to do the first time I use it is I have to adjust the height. And once I've adjusted the height, now I never have to mess with that again. Because right? every time I bring this up, bang, it's gonna hit there. So I, I touch the sandpaper on here, right? But there's one more thing I have to do. Paraffin, okay, make it a little more slippery. Turn the speed down a little bit, and there we go. And the steady rest is now applied. And you see how this is, you know, no matter how I turn this, it, it aligns itself as it makes contact with the work. And you see, I can work on both sides of this. You know, most, most of the steady rests that have the wheels and all that stuff, um, they obstruct the front. And you really don't want to obstruct the front because that's where your hands are, that's where your tool rest is. I can work on both sides of the steady rest. Uh, you know, to agree, actually I can shift this over even more like that. And now I can work way over to the side here on both sides of the steady rest. But I can also turn the workpiece in for him when I need to, right? So let's just see how this is gonna work. Remember when I said that a roughing gouge is straight across and has sharp 90 degree corners. Well, here's why it needs to have 90 degree corners. Because you want to work in this shoulder 
Look. Remember what I said, when you start roughing out, those vibrations can sometimes cause it to get loose. And I didn't check that. So here I'm going in with this with the gouge right into the corner. I'm just going to rough out a little bit more here. I'm just going to check this in there. Okay. So one thing you'll notice here as I start working in the middle is that that sound is really solid, doesn't it? You know what's vibrating is this thing vibrates. I don't know what it is. Maybe I'll be better. This is getting a little hot because I've got it too tight. Let's just see what the steady rest will do. So this is a, a practice piece that I'm just gonna see what we can do with this. This is the half inch spindle gouge, the half inch spindle gouge. Yep. Now, in most spindle turnings, the rule of thumb is that the small diameters are approximately half the diameter of the, the full diameter. Of course, there's a lot of difference there, but that's get kind of a rule of thumb. Um, when, you, when you start out making a piece that's long and thin, you know, you could start out without the steady wrist. And, and uh, you've got the whole mass of the square going in terms of the rigidity of the workpiece. And things go along pretty well for a while because you've got all that thickness. But then you turn from the square down to a round. And when you go from the square down to the round, you're removing 22% of the material. Now, as you start cutting your pattern into the and you're cutting down to a diameter that's half um, of the original diameter. Now, that, that cross-section now is one quarter of what it was when it was round. So now you've got a quarter of 78%, and your, the strength of your workpiece now is, is down to about 20% of what it was when you started with the square. So as you get near the end of the turning, just when you think, every, just when you need everything to be going right, things start to go wrong. So that's why what I do is I put the steady wrist on first. Don't wait until the vibrations become a problem. Kill it before it starts by putting the steady wrist on first. And that's what I did there. Now I'm just gonna just continue on this just for a moment here. I'm going to a smaller chisel. I'm going to move over here.
this thing's hitting me in this in the belly. I wonder if I can go. Oh, I can't go that. You want to move the steady rest closest to where you're working as close as you can. But you don't want to move the steady rest too many times. Um, but what I like to do is leave the steady rest in one place and work on both sides of it. And then just move it once at the end. Is when you start um, turning a long, thin work piece, is do the hard part first. So what is the hard part? Well, the hard part might be the place where there's the most small details, right? So you would want to attack, especially if those details are near the middle. So why is the middle the hard part? Because the, the basic oscillation of the workpiece is like this. And so the amplitude is always the greatest in the middle. Um, so do the middle first. And as you work closer to the ends, you're working on the part that's going to have less vibration by, by nature because it's being held by the centers. So just another, another couple minutes on this, I want you to see um, what the capabilities of this type of steady rest, and you see how simple it is. And I don't know, I mean, how small, how small could I make this? How small could I make it? You know, keep in mind, this is 30 inches long. So right here is when someone says, oh, well, what would happen if you took the steady rest away? <laughs> well, last time I did that, the piece flew off the lathe. Well, maybe, well, what would happen if I took the steady rest away? Well, that, that's what would happen. 